relationship with you. Greetings, friends, in the mighty, majestic, and miraculous name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We bring you greetings from the Christ-Centered Apostolic Ministries, located at 5915 Bramble Avenue in the historic community of Madisonville, where yours truly, Bishop Thomas D. Jordan, is the pastor and the founder and where the vision of our church is located in the well-known phrase, leading God's people from membership to relationship for a Christ-centered apostolic ministries. If you hear the words of the early Reverend James Moore, our relationship with the Lord is all the world to us. Praise the Lord again to everyone in that electrical region we affectionately refer to as television land and also by way of the World Wide Web, we bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. We are here. With no other uh, agenda but to bring forth God's word and to make it uh, palatable and so that you may understand it. And uh, also we pray for two things. Most and foremost we pray because it is the will of the Lord that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth that as a result of these teachings you will be led to a saving faith in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that also uh, as a result of watching these broadcasts you will be provoked to study, open up your Bibles and read them, and to search the scriptures daily as the Bereans did in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts where it declares they search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And we pray that you do that. Um, we take this time now before we move any further and just ask Father in Jesus' name, Lord God, we, we thank you, Father, for another opportunity to bring forth your word. It is a wonder and it is a miracle that you use flesh and that you use finite man and fallible man to bring forth an infinite and Im Im immortal and powerful and mighty word, your word. I pray, Lord God, you give us clarity of thought, make your message clear, understandable, provoke, Lord God, curiosity in the unbeliever provoke the believer to become more of a student than they are now. And I pray most of all again, Lord God, that you open up somebody's heart, that they will be led to a faith in you. Receive you as Savior, Father, before it is everlasting too late, as you have encouraged us in your word and exhorted us in your word to save ourselves from this untoward generation. Command a blessing now in our city and the new leadership in the city. And Father, move throughout our state, throughout our country, Lord God. Father, where politics are going on, Father, we look forward to the day when the government shall rest upon your shoulders, Lord God, and that day shall be wonderful. Hallelujah, mighty of God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, wonderful Counselor. Father, we do look forward again to your eternal reign. Bless always, Father, our producer and director, Brother Vanderveer and his family, Lord God, and his ministry. And the praise and glory shall be yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We uh, want to... Um, extend to everybody a heartfelt and sincere um, invitation to worship with us at Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries. We again are located at 5915 Bramble Avenue in the Madisonville, historic Madisonville, the corner of Short Wetzel and Bramble. Uh, if you're coming up Madison Road, um, going north of Madison Road, you hit Wetzel, take a right and break Bramble, take Wetzel all the way into Bramble, dead ends into Bramble, make a left and we are there right there at the corner. Bramble and Short Wetzel service times are 11 a.m. Uh, a Sunday service, Sunday worship, and then Wednesday Bible class at 7 p.m. We are currently going through the Bible, and you will find us in the book of 1 Kings, getting ready to go into the book of 2 Kings, and just seeing what the Word of the Lord says. Um, we have, uh, the church is 16 years old, going on 17, and we uh, just recently celebrated our 20 seventh year hard to believe it's been that many years since bishop nichols turned us loose but our 27th year um in ministry and if you've been watching these broadcasts for a while i almost look like president Bar Bar barack obama you know the president's getting office and they don't have as much gray on their hair in their head when they took over and now you may see a little more gray i was looking at today it's like gee we as a gray's kind of sneaking in there uh but uh we just thank the lord for longevity and, uh, and thank God for his blessings. All right, we are going to
begin today uh, with a series uh, spurred on again by some reading. You know, I, I said before, uh, I'm an avid reader. I pray that the uh, ones that are watching this broadcast are readers. Uh, readers are leaders and readers are followers. Um, I don't believe everything I read, but I am a reader. And I said to our congregation a um, couple of weeks ago that some of the best books in my library are authored by people who have a theological position that I do not necessarily agree with. I like books. I like point counterpoint. I like looking at other perspectives and I like books that make you think and, and make you solidify your point biblically to be in the scriptures. And so it is the Bible which we are, which is on trial in this day and age. And uh, we'll make allusion to and make reference to a word called postmodernism here in a minute. Uh, but I'm a reader. Um, there's a book that has blessed me and I'm not, I don't know if I'll go verbatim uh, what she declared, but there's a book uh, by a young lady named Amy Orr Ewing. Um, she is on staff with Ravi Zacharias and Ravi Zacharias being the intellectual and the theologian that he is, the dynamic lady on board. And so we're going to use as the topic from her book, um, is the Bible intolerant? Um, is the Bible is the Bible intolerant? Um, is the Bible intolerant? And that will bring in five uh, areas. Is the Bible sexist? Is the Bible oppressive? Is the Bible homophobic? Is the Bible outdated? And is the Bible irrelevant? Is the Bible intolerant? Tolerant means you don't have any patience or, or, uh, or, or uh, tolerance for other views or other viewpoints. And so the Bible is on trial. And I, could, I would suggest to you that it is not what the Bible has taught, but is what people are using the Bible to teach. Our, our starting point, two passages, 1 Peter 3 and 15. Um, my strengths in the body of Christ is that of an apologist. That is my, uh, my, uh, uh, my strength and my, my niche and my gift in the body of Christ is that as an apologist. Uh, apology is a, is a Greek word meaning defense. It's not apologizing for anything, but a defense of the Christian faith. But 1 Peter 3 and verse number 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. All right. Um, it is at this point that we're going to give you a reasonable hope for our confidence in the scriptures, in the word of God. A couple of the passages of scripture. I had said one more, but a couple of more. Second Timothy uh, 2.15. Actually, let me leave, read First Timothy 3.16 first, and then we'll come back to 2 Timothy 3.16 first, and then we'll come back to 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning it's God breathed, it is a product from God, the spirit of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly or thoroughly furnished or equipped under all good works I say to all you preachers out there the equip the, the equipping tool for your ministry is the word of God the equipping tool for your ministry is the word of God now second Timothy 2 15 study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, the Bible, in defense of the Bible. Um, and once again, the name of the author here of this book that is going to help us out over the next few weeks is the Bible Intolerant, Amy or Ewing is her uh, uh, name, um, and we're going to discuss some things uh, as, as, as we start off even here today. Isn't it a matter, isn't it all a matter of interpretation? The way you interpret it is not the way I interpret it. We know we got various interpretations, and this is what has spawned various denominations. We got denominations everywhere divided over it really matters of interpretation and philosophy. Can we know anything about history? 
excuse me, are the Bible, are the biblical manuscripts reliable? Is the content of the manuscripts reliable? What about the canon? What I mean, how we, how we have come to include uh, uh, the books of scripture, uh, book to make up the scriptures. Who made up the, who, who came up with that concept of, the, of what was in the Bible, what was left out? You got a book called the Forgotten Books of the Bible and the Lost, the Forgotten Books of the Bible and the Lost Books of Eden. You got books around here like that. Elaine Pagels has made uh, the Gnostic Gospels famous in trying to insinuate that the church purposely left out books that should have been included in the canon. Uh, what about the other holy books? Isn't the Bible sexist? What about all the wars? Isn't the Bible out of date on sex? And how can I know? Uh, these five things in, in, in particular, is the Bible intolerant? Is the overall theme, but is the Bible sexist? Is the Bible oppressive? Is the Bible homophobic, outdated, and irrelevant? All right, let's start off here. So we got our foundation. We are here to begin to have given an apology or defense for the word of God, but the word of God has been doing a good job with, without me defending itself over these 2,000 years of Christendom since its inception. So we got 1 Peter 3.15. We're going to give you an answer concerning the hope that lies within us. We have made the statement based off the scriptures that the scriptures are inspired by God. It is the it is this belief and the conviction of this preacher that the Bible is not doesn't just contain the word of God. It is the very word of God. And since it is the word of God, we must obey its exhortation to study it. We are to study to show thyself a prudent to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And one of the reasons we are going through the Bible in our Bible studies, we have this discussion with our saints. Um, every once in a while we break into for topics during Bible study, but we've been going through the Bible and we are in, in challenging our saints to take the time and read through the Bible because it is our conviction and it is true that many people make statements, have theological concepts and ideas, and they have no idea whatsoever what the Bible teaches, let alone what the Bible says and teaches. So, amen. The Bible on trial. Is the Bible intolerant? And Amy Orr Ewing says she's traveled the globe for over 30 years and she comes to, I'm going to just, some things I highlighted as I was going through that I want to share with you. The diminishing, the diminishing value of words and the dismissal of truth as a category on metaphysical issues is popular and celebrated. The diminishing value of words. Words don't mean words. Words don't have meanings anymore. The words are meant by the context in which they're found, which is quite honest with you, that, it, that is a truth statement in terms of the way we interpret scripture, because I can hear a bishop talking in my ears now. In Bible study and preaching, words and phrases must be interpreted according to the context in which they are found. But it has taken on a different meaning in secular society. Society Words don't mean words anymore. All right. You know, English language is funny anyway, but the diminishing value of words and then the dismissal of truth is a category. Ain't nothing true anymore. You know, well, the way you see it is not the way I see it. Where everybody sees everything differently. There's nothing true anymore. That's quite honest with you. People who are supposed to be academic and intellectual coming up with statements like that. If there's nothing as true as truth, then two plus two ain't two. And my name ain't Thomas Darren Jordan. And I've been believing a lie for the last 46 years. But the diminishing value of words and the dismissal of truth, all is relative. But the words of Winston Churchill offered in the context of intelligence and counterintelligence efforts during World War II still haunt us, this lady says. In time of war, when truth is so precious, it must be attended by a bodyguard of lies. She says, I believe this surrender of truth is the benchmark of our culture's greatest crisis for it restricts meaningful dialogue on questions of the soul. And here it is. We are dealing with scriptures. We're dealing in dealing with the scriptures. We are dealing with the reality and the existence of God. And not only that, in light of the existence of God, we are dealing with eternal matters, dealing, dealing with eternal life. Jesus said, what is a profit of man to gain the world and lose his own soul. There is absolutely no doubt that the Christian message stands or falls upon the authenticity 
or spuriousness of the Bible, the flimsiness, all right, the, the questionable uh, 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 questions about the Bible. Knowing it to be God's word, millions across history have staked their lives on it. Destiny defining trust has been placed in it. Graveside hope has been blessed, has been based on it. Extraordinary good has been spread because of it. The Bible, the charters of nations have been built upon it. With equal intensity, others have sought to expel it, and wrong-headed zeal has caused untold evil in its name. There is no book in history that has been so studied, so used, and so abused as the Holy Bible. When Pilate asked Jesus the question, what is truth? Jesus answered him with a categorical response. And in fact, Jesus was asking Pilate if, he was a genuine, if, a, if his was a genuine question or purely an academic one. Jesus was not merely checking on Pilate's sincerity. He was opening up Pilate's heart to himself to reveal to Pilate his unwillingness to deal with the implications of Jesus's answer. What is truth? That it was asked. Uh, they who are on the side of truth, listen to me, Jesus said. Intent in the pursuit of truth is prior to content or to the availability of it. The author George MacDonald once said to give truth to him who loves it not is only to give him more plentiful reasons for misinterpretation. Scripture is the revelation of God by Jesus' own attestation. So the Bible is, again, the word of God. Um, in some countries the, of the world, the book we are discussing here, Amy Ewing brings up as contraband. And she says, I found it intriguing that the Bible should inspire such sacrifice and courage in the hearts of those who want to read it. The Bible on trial. And so uh, there was a series of questions that have been posed to her. And these questions have been posed to me in my ministry. We want to ask um, you uh, state some things around some people and people look at you like you're a, a creature out of, out, out of from outer space, a creature from the Black Lagoon. And they look at you as if to say, you don't honestly mean to tell us that you think Jesus actually said the words recorded in the Gospels or for that matter, that the events recorded in the Bible really took place. Well, yes, we do. Uh, a conviction that the Bible must be wrong, held by those at the highest level of academic excellence, seems in turn to have been embraced at a popular level by many people who have been, who have barely glanced at the Bible. That's what we're talking about, but who feel sure that is not to be trusted. Haven't even cracked open a Bible, and 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 doubt so much. How are you going to doubt that which you haven't cracked open? Amen. We are using a word in a, today that we will interpret in the here in the future. Bring out a definition: postmodern. Postmodern. Many people in this postmodern age are not interested in truth anymore. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall be free. So what this rest of this particular broadcast, let us deal with this statement. Isn't it all a matter of interpretation? I mean, it's the way you interpret it. And the way you interpret it is not the way I interpret it. You know, when I get stuff like that and I hear that, and I, if I say something in Bible study, and some people have gotten comfortable when I'm ministering, they'll raise their hand and I got to head them off the pass because I say, you mess with my flow here a little bit. I'm in a little flow. I will take your question after I'm through. And so, um, praise the Lord. Um, when people make statements and say, well, I don't think, it, see it that way. Bishop Nichols used to be, have a little funny response when people would say that. Said, I, I can't see that, or I don't see it that way. He said, they just admitting that they blind when they say, I can't see that. All right. But they said, that's your interpretation. Then I said, well, what, what, how would you interpret it? Looking at the words and what the words apparently mean, how would you interpret it? If, the interpret if my interpretation is wrong and I'm off, how would you give me the interpretation then? All right. Um, so people say it's all a matter of interpretation. Again, we've got to study to show thyself or prudent to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly interpreting the word of truth. That means there is a correct interpretation in terms of the scriptures. And again, the problem with so many people is not that the Bible is messed up. It's the people who are quoting it and reading it and preaching and teaching it are messing up, amen, people's minds with the scriptures. And so people are uninformed, misinformed, 
Amen. Not it formed at all. <clears throat> but don't be that way. You want to become a student of the scriptures. Hallelujah. Um, the, the, again, the issue of whether words have any meaning is incredibly important as we tackle this issue. Isn't it a all matter of interpretation? Um, I'm going to read this uh, little thing here. And it will show you the fallacy called because we call it the language game. Um, Amy Ewing says one one occasion she was talking to a fellow traveler at an airport. She had just finished a book. The person that she was talking to had just finished a book, which expl explained claimed that Jesus married Mary Magdalene and ended up living hip, happily ever after in Mesopotamia. You heard that one. That is a result of the famous book by Mr. Brown called the Da Vinci Code. All right, and also with the movie, uh, spurring it on, The Da Vinci Code. Another friend of mine had read the same book and had drawn completely different conclusions from it. And when I mentioned this, my fellow traveler was not at all surprised. And as the conversation progressed, it became clear that the historical source material was not really important to her. This new book that she had enjoyed and the different conclusions drawn from it by intelligent people just went to show that there are many interpretations of any text. This was then extended to apply to the Bible and the events it records. Meaning could not be really fixed. There is just a sea of valid opinions, and no one reality is to be found among them all. That's, what we're, that's what's going on. Ain't it? Everybody's got a reality. We call it, we live in a plural society. Ain't nothing true. That's just what you believe. What you believe is not what I believe, okay? The big issue behind the increasing number of questions about meaning and interpretation is the question of whether words and text, again, have any inherent meaning at all. It's like Brother Andy, amen, he has a fine young grandson, great-grandson, amen, um, and he says to him, sit down, and somebody says, sit down on me, what it what it doesn't mean sit down. Well, what does it mean if it doesn't mean sit down, sit your behind down, be still? <laughs> what does it mean? Words got words have any meaning anymore? What about be quiet? What does that mean? Well, that really doesn't mean it's what it, it means what it means to you, but it doesn't mean what it means to me. Well, to me, it means be quiet. So, now, so, so, so we so we get into the merry-go-round. Let me go on and finish this off. Does it all just come down to a matter of opinion? Is every interpretation equally valid? These are, these are valid questions. Can this text actually speak to me or do I make it mean what I want? This was powerfully communicated to my husband, she says, a few years ago. He is an Anglican priest and had performed a friend's wedding. And after the church service, we were sitting at a beautiful reception around or a round table. Amy Ewing, the author, this is what the book like, that, that cover right there, that's what the book like. Okay, book looks like. After the church service, we were sitting at a beautiful reception around a round table, and I was talking to the young man sitting next to me, and my husband was sitting next to the young man's girlfriend. And as we began to talk, the man stopped the mid-sentence and suddenly blurted out an apology. He said he found that, for some reason, he couldn't lie to me and explain that before coming to the wedding, he and his girlfriend had decided to swap lives. This is interesting. He was a wealthy management consultant, and she was an artist. They had wanted to see if people treated them differently according to their status, so they pretended to have each other's jobs. And as we talked about why he might be uncomfortable about lying to me and other spiritual things, we looked over at our partners and he said, I wonder if my girlfriend has managed to hoodwink your husband. I silently prayed. And after the wedding, Fro uh, Frog, this is a nickname of uh, Amy Ewing's husband, explained to me that the young woman had also found herself unable to lie to him. They also had begun to talk about God. And at one point she had said, the reason I am not a Christian is that I am studying English literature and I don't believe that there is a transcendental signified or a God. So I can make the Bible mean whatever I want it to mean. Frog asked her to clarify and she explained that she believed that words have no actual meaning. A word on a page or a word being heard only has a meaning that a reader or a hearer gives it. It does not itself carry any ultimate meaning because there is no God or transcendental signified to give ultimate meaning to words. My husband looked at her and said, if that is the case, if words have no meaning, wow, three minutes, if words have no meaning, except the meaning of the listener or reader, is it okay with you if I take what you have just said to mean, I believe in Jesus and I am a Christian? And at that moment, she looked a little worried. 
she realized that her argument failed its own test. The standards by which she was judging the Bible were standards that her own thinking could not measure up to. This issue of words, of whether words have any meaning, is incredibly important as we look at the Christian faith and as we offer the source materials about the life of Jesus, the New Testament Gospels, to our friends who do not believe in him. If the Bible only means what we take, what we make it mean, there is no point in reading it to discover anything about God. There's a point. It is kind of interesting stuff. All right. Uh, one theory, literary theorist wrote literature by refusing to assign a secret and ultimate meaning to the text and to the world as text liberates what may be called an anti-theological activity, an activity that is truly revolutionary since to refuse to fix meaning is in the end to refuse God. And then you hear the Bible say, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Isn't it interesting? Fred, Frederick Nietzsche, I think that's how you pronounce it. My wife's better at pronouncing things like that. I need her here. God bless her. We cannot get rid of God until we get rid of grammar. Interesting. Uh, the d idea is later echoed, and I'm getting ready to sign off here on a supposed statement from the atheist Bertrand Russell. Everyday language embodies the metaphysics of the Stone Age. The desire to liberate the human being from the constraint of a god is powerfully linked with this, with this issue of language and meaning. So words have got to mean words. We're going to we gonna examine words. It's like uh, uh, Elder Johnny James is a teaching called the unbiblical, the illegitimate use of unbiblical words. So the Bible's on trial. Does it mean what it says it means? It, does it, or would it, would it, just some mystical interpretation we come up with. And since we come up with the interpretation, you automatically are allowed to dismiss it. We're going to see what the Bible says. Friends, I hope you have listened to what we said. Make you think and not holler at you. Not grab the mic and swing off the chandelier. We're going to cause you to think, use your mind. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the material discussed on this broadcast, you may address your cards and our letters to Christ Center Apostolic Ministries, 5915 Bramble Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45227. You may contact us by phone at 527-4567. Uh, may the Lord continue to bless you even as we've entered, amen, the holiday season. And until the next broadcast, as our Father in the Gospel, Bishop Dr. Alfred H. Nichols would say, may God bless you and have a smile upon you is our prayer. Greetings, friends, in the mighty, majestic, and miraculous name of the Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. We bring in greetings from the Christ Center Apostolic Ministries, located at 5915 Bramwell Avenue in the historic community of Madisonville, where yours truly, Elder Thomas D. Jordan, is the pastor and the founder, and where the vision of our church is to lead God's people from membership to relationship. As you hear the words of the early, as we like to refer to him, Reverend James Moore, our relationship with the Lord is all the world to us. Praise the Lord again to everyone in that electrical region we refer to as television land. Welcome again to the Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries broadcast emanating to you from the place we affectionately call CCAM, 5915 Bramble Avenue. Um, and uh, we are in the business for the Lord and here to bring forth, as we like to declare, the unadulterated Word of God. And we pray that as a result of these broadcasts, yes, indeed, that you will come to a saving faith in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be born again to the Scriptures, born of water and spirit, according to John 3, 3 through 5, obeying the gospel as they did on the, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 38, when the question went forth, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the response came, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in 2,000 years later, some 2,000 years later, the call and the invitation still stands to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And at a minimum, we pray that as you watch this broadcast, you will, uh, as you're watching, take your Bibles out, take your notes, follow along with us, and have the spirit of the Bereans, according to Acts chapter 17, verse number 11, the Bereans heard the word of the disciples and didn't dismiss it, didn't cast it away as folly, utter foolishness, ridiculousness. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. We would like to extend to you a cordial invitation to worship with us at Christ Southern Apostolic Ministries. And we are located at 5915 Bramble Avenue, address there on your screen. There's a phone number also address on your screen. Uh, 5915 Bramble Avenue, again, the historic community of Madisonville. We are housed in the former Bramble Federal and Savings and Loan Building. If you're coming up Madison Road, coming up north on Madison, you make a right on Wetzel Avenue, take Wetzel to runs all the way out into Bramble. And as soon as you get to the corner of Wetzel and Bramble, you'll be making a left, dead ending in Bramble, you're making a left uh, um, onto Bramble and you will see it right on the corner there, Christ-Centered Apostolic Ministries. Uh, we have service at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning and Bible study at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. Right now we are studying uh, out of the book of Leviticus, out of the book of Leviticus, praise the Lord. And uh, without further ado, um, we want to get back into the subject matter at hand. And um, again, we uh, uh, say uh, praise the Lord to uh, all the members of my family again. And, and we reiterate that we have dedicated these remainder of these broadcasts uh, in the memory of our uh, nephew, uh, Staff Sergeant Richard Joseph Jordan, who tragically lost his life while in uh, service for his country over in Mosul, Iraq. Uh, in March, also my niece, Denise Tompkins, who lost her life in February, 23 years old. Staff Sergeant Richard Jordan was 29 years old. And last but not least, certainly not least, my mother-in-law, my mother's, my wife's sister, Jackie Jordan's mother, Dorothy Mae Valentine, who passed away at the age of 80, March 18th of this year. Um, and uh, so it has been a tough year starting off, but God's grace is sufficient for us and his strength is made perfect in weakness. Praise God. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God and are thee called according to his purpose. All right. We are dealing with the subject matter at hand. Why Christ must return. Why Christ must return. We will read uh, out of 2 Peter uh, again, pertinent scriptures, verses 1 through 4. And then I'll drop down and read verses 8 through 10. 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and then verses, <coughs> excuse me, verses 8, 9, and 10. Allergies. Summer's here. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient to usward, that not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will, shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The Lord is coming back again, and we are going to establish that in nine points. Again, utilizing material from the outstanding Bible expositor, teacher, preacher from California out of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California, John uh, MacArthur, and why Christ must return. Why Christ must return. has got to come back for various reasons. There are nine reasons. Reason number one, if you're marking us down, the promise of God 
demands it. First reason why Christ must return, the promise of God demands it. Um, the Old Testament was full of messianic promise. In fact, it's fair to say that the coming Messiah was the main focus of the Old Testament, as I like to re- quote uh, in teaching, as we've heard from our, one of our fathers in the gospel, the Honorable Dr. Elder Johnny James, who's just in town, as a matter of fact, and will be coming to Christ Center in August. We'll give you those dates when he's coming, the Honorable Dr. Johnny James. If, and and he'll, he'll say, if you keep reading the Old Testament, it'll say, if somebody is coming, it's talking about Jesus. The first hint of, messianic, of a Messianic Redeemer came in Genesis 3, right after Adam's fall, when God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. That was Genesis 3.15. And in the closing chapter of the final book of the Old Testament, God promised that the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Malachi 4 and 2. Between those two promises, the entire Old Testament is filled with prophecies of the coming deliverer. At least 333 distinct promises by one count. More than 100 of those prophecies were literally fulfilled at the first advent of Christ. Amen. Um, all the prophecies, I'm not going to get into all of the detailed ones. There were the ones that said he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7 and 14. Uh, Micah foresaw that Bethlehem would be his birthplace, Micah 5 and 2. The experience of Old Testament Israel graphically foreshadowed him as being called out of Egypt, Hosea 11 and 1. Isaiah foretold that he would be a descendant of Jesse, King David's father, and that he would be uniquely anointed with the Spirit of God, Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. Zechariah prophesied that he would enter Jerusalem riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, Zechariah 9 and 9. Psalm 41 and 9 predicted that he would be betrayed by a familiar friend with whom he had shared a meal. Uh, That was fulfilled in Matthew 10 and 4. Zechariah also prophesied that he would be stricken and his sheep scattered anticipating that he would be forsaken by his own closest disciples. Zechariah also foretold the exact price of Judas's betrayal, 30 pieces of silver, as well as what would become of the betrayal money. Isaiah foretold many details of the crucifixion, and David foretold many additional details of the tortures Christ endured at the cross, including his last cry to the Father, the piercing of his hands and feet, and the parting of his garment, Psalm 22, David also prophetically foretold that none of his bones would be broken, Psalm 34, 20. And elsewhere, David alluded to the resurrection, Psalm 16 and 10, quoted by Peter in Acts 2 and 28. All the prophecies dealing with the first advent or the first coming of Christ were fulfilled precisely and literally. I mean, that is mathematical mir- miraculousness. I don't know if that's a word, but I just made up a word. It is a miracle that one human being fulfilled all these prophecies in that they were filled in one human being in and of himself. A miracle. His riding on a donkey, the parting of his garments, the piercing of his hands and feet, and the vivid prophecies of his re- rejection by men in Isaiah 53. All these might have been interpreted symbolically by Old Testament scholars before Christ. But the New Testament record, record repeatedly reports that such things were fulfilled in the most literal sense, so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Amen. So moving forward, it stands to reason that the remaining two-thirds of Old Testament Messianic prophecies will also be fulfilled literally, and that requires the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. (coughs) When Christ took up the scroll in his hometown synagogue at Nazareth and began to read in God's perfect timing. The scheduled reading for that week came from Isaiah 61. If we look in Luke, the fourth chapter, the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, Dr. Luke, who also wrote wrote the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter four, uh, verse 16, it says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, 
and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say, And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, or the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And verse 21 says, And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. If you were to compare that text with the text which was quoted, which he read from in Isaiah, we see that Christ stopped reading abruptly in the middle of a sentence. And then we have the full text in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise with the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The rest of the chapter from Isaiah goes on to describe the blessings of the millennial kingdom. We believe in the millennium. We are millennialist, premillennialist. We are in this camp because we believe in the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. He described the blessings of the millennial kingdom when the earth brings forth its bud as a garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Verse 11 in Isaiah 61, Christ deliberately stopped reading mid sentence because the day of vengeance of our God pertains to his second advent, not his first. Many Old Testament prophecies seem to telescope messianic events the same way so that it was not always immediately obvious when one portion of a prophecy referred to the first coming of Christ while another portion referred to his second coming. Employing the Old Testament alone, anyone would have found it very difficult to discern any distinction between the two classes of messianic prophecies. But here are some familiar Old Testament prophecies about Christ that await fulfillment at his second coming. Psalm chapter 2. We know this speaks of Christ because verse 7 is quoted several times in the New Testament and applied to him. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Yet many aspects of this psalm await future fulfillment. Verse 6 suggests an earthly reign where in Psalm chapter 2 that is yet to be realized. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The kingdom of the judgment described in verses 8 and 9 also have yet to be fulfilled literally. And I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Amen. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, this familiar passage also seems to have both the first and second comings of Christ in view. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This plainly refers to his first advent or his first coming, anticipating the angel's promise to Mary in Luke 1 and 35. But the rest of Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, describes him as a king in glory on David's throne. And the government will be upon his shoulder, not Obama's shoulders, Jesus' shoulders. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Christ himself pointed to his second coming as a time when he would assume that throne in a literal sense. For he said in Matthew 25 and 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. One more passage, a couple more passages out of uh, the Old Testament. Micah 4 and 3, he shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn or study 
war anymore. I hear the honorable, great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. using that text, amen, in preaching in the civil rights movement. <clears throat> but it is referring to Jesus coming back, setting up his kingdom. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One more, Zechariah 14, verses 4 through 9. Zechariah describes the second coming graphically. Again, don't miss the point. Many theories about this, that, and the other, and the second coming, the beast, the antichrist, the false prophet, who the antichrist is. Some people got out there right now. They think President Barack Obama is the antichrist and is really many, beyond the scope. There's no way in the world Barack Obama could be the antichrist. No way in the world, according to what the antichrist is going to do. They said Reagan was the antichrist. You know how many people they have said was the antichrist? You know, the best defense against the Antichrist is to be in Christ. So when the Antichrist pops up, Christ can catch you away with him in heaven. That's the best defense against the Antichrist. 666, Damien, Omen, whatever's coming. That's the best defense. Be in Christ so you can get caught up to meet him. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, be caught up to meet him in the air. Zechariah 14, 4 and 9. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, ye shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. And it shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. There shall be light in the evening time. Hallelujah. That was a great song by the uh, Honorable Bishop G.T. Haywood. Uh, there shall be light in the evening time. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. I love this verse. And in that day it shall be, the Lord is one and his name one. That's the New King James Version rendering. I like the King James Version rendering. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Amen. His name shall be one. One Lord and his name one. What's his name going to be? The great name of salvation. The great name revealed from God, from glory. Jesus, that's going to be his name. So the Old Testament, the Old Testament, which we refer to the Old Testament, the promise of God in the Old Testament demands it, demands that Jesus has got to come back or else we've got an unfinished book. We've got some unfinished business. Scripture says God cannot lie and he will not change his mind according to Titus 1 and 2 and Numbers 23. And 19, what he has promised, he will do. And much of what he promised about Christ requires that the Savior return to earth in triumph in order to bring it to pass. The truthfulness of the Bible is at stake. You know, I've been telling, I've been saying this, I've kind of hit on a theme and repetitiveness over the last few weeks with the saints of Christ and apostolic ministries. Let me tell y'all something. I, I'm busy. A lot of my saints say, he's a busy man. I'm busy. I am busy. I got so much going on right now, and I keep finding stuff to do. I am busy. And listen, if this is a joke, I'm being honest with you right now. If this is a joke, if I've been spending pockets of my time every month coming out here to this studio, taping broadcast to be delivering you uh, nonsense, to bamboozle you, to hoodwink you, if this is nonsense, if it's a fraud, if it's a myth, if the Holy Ghost doesn't work, if Jesus isn't real, if God isn't real, if the Bible is a farce, is a farce, is a farce then let's shut the whole thing down. Let's go home. Let's find something else to do. I could be at home eating my wife's good cooking. My wife, look, the greatest miracle since the virgin birth, the resurrection, and me being saved is I, I have been married 
to the best cook for almost 25 years and have hardly put on a pound. That's a miracle. You mean to tell me I'm going to spend all this time and missing my wife, like uh, Johnny James says, miss my wife's good loving and good cooking? Man, I go home and, and be enjoying my wife, be enjoying my family if this is a farce, but this is real. The truthfulness of the Bible is at stake. It's at stake. And the Bible has declared that Christ will come back. God demands it. He will come back. Jesus is coming back again. You can take that to the bank. Amen. And we ought to be living according to the text, 2 Peter 3, in light of that fact that Christ could come at any time. Here's the point. I'm not here to set any dates. I'm not, but some people say a doomsday prognosticator. I'm not here to set any dates because that's not biblical. One of the points I was hitting on before we had to wrap up the last broadcast, we got people that set dates according to a calendar, and it is according to our calendar. Our, our cal but there's been the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar. There's a Bible calendar that doesn't even match our calendar. And so you got to figure out which calendar you're using. Are you, are you rocking the dates? Or we, like the gene, 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 uh, geologists, they have one date for how old the earth is another set of geologists have a date for how old they think the earth is and another set of geologists come up with another date all right so you know they ask the question are you dating the rocks or are you rocking the dates so we got people that are rocking the dates so i'm not here like colin deal did in 1984 four minutes 1984 1988 to declare the day and the hour when jesus will return or 1984 or, 19, or he declared why Jesus will return in 1988 or the day and hour when Jesus shall return, colon D. I don't know if he's still alive anymore. I ain't here to set any dates, but I will say this. As we have to wrap up, the return of Christ is not necessarily immediate, meaning he's coming back in the next five minutes. He could, but it is imminent, meaning he could come at any time. So as we've established, it could be the next five minutes and it could be the next 500 years, but he is coming back just like he said he would, the Bible demands it. The scriptures have to be fulfilled. The Bible, God demands it, that he's got to come back. Or else the Old Testament, the Bible, is a book of unfinished business. And Jesus is coming back to take care of his business. As I have to wrap, we got three minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, I, I, I pray that this is putting something on somebody's mind. Again, I, I, put the, I put the challenge out all the time. If this is false, you prove this to be a theory, a far, a hocus. And I always put it like this. If you can't believe this, what book are you going to believe? You can't, you can't dismiss this on certain theories and then not be admitting that you're going to have to use the same acid test any other book. If you're going to dismiss this book and not believe this, what other book are you going to believe? Jesus is coming back, and it behooves us to get, make our calling and election sure it behooves us to get our lives right with God. And if he doesn't, even if he doesn't come, death is imminent. We've lost so many family members at the beginning of this year. And I think it's impressing upon our mind that life is fragile, like the scriptures declare it is. Life is but a vapor. And we need, amen, to get our house in order. As a prophet told, uh, amen, Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're getting ready to die. Get your business in order. Praise God. And so, if you have any questions or comments about any of the material that we have discussed on this broadcast, and I hope we put something on your mind, something for you to think about, address your cards and letters to Christ Center Apostolic Ministries, 5915 Bramble Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45227. Um, you want to be saved? Call us. You can be saved today. You can be saved today. Water for your baptism. Clothing for your apparel. Holy Ghost from heaven, ready to fill you. So you can contact us, and uh, we pray uh, that you will get in touch with us and take your time and drop us a line. And in the words of our Father in the Gospel, the Honorable Bishop Dr. Alfred H. Nichols, until the next time, may God bless you and heaven smile upon you is our prayer. Music quiet by yourself.